Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James Olfield here with you. This is December the 3rd, and we hope that you're ready for a study from God's Word. A Word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ that meets in Eden, 250 the Boulevard in Eden, and we're, you're always welcome to come and visit us there on Sundays at 9 a.m. for a Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study. So we hope that you're ready for uh, study from God's Word. If you're if you're looking for a place to study the Bible and you want to ask Bible questions, you want individuals to uh, take you seriously about your Bible questions. If you have a serious Bible question and you're really looking for the truth, friends, we we love to study the Bible. We'll be glad to answer your questions, and, and especially on in our class periods, like on Thursday nights or Sunday mornings. You know, it's uh, uh, open floor. We'll we'll take your questions, and uh, if you have anything that a uh, question about anything that we've said during the sermons. We've got to talk to you afterwards and just take all the time we need to to answer your questions and we'll give you a word from the Lord. We'll definitely make sure that what we're giving you is from the Bible. And uh, uh, if you come to any of our assemblies or you've seen our TV programs or tent meetings or whatever, you'll know that uh, we put the scriptures up on the screen so you know for a fact that you're getting it from the Bible. So we want you to come out and visit with us and uh, uh, study God's Word with us anytime you have a chance. Our phone numbers today, this is a live call-in program, so our phone numbers, if you want to be a part of the program, uh, 336 is the area code. So 336-427-9696. That's 427-WMYN or 627-9563. That's 627-WLOE is how you can reach us. You call in anytime uh, during this program and we'll put you on the air and you you can ask your Bible question. We'll have a dialogue and and uh, just a, a good conversation about uh, the Bible. Today, our lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, a comment that was made on one of our uh, YouTube channels and YouTube uh, uh, lessons. And we're going to be discussing that. If Is Tim Tebow really a Christian? And it's really not about Tim Tebow, but it's really going to be what is a Christian? You know, how do we know what what a Christian is? I mean, who's to say uh, Tim Tebow is a Christian? Uh, is he a Christian? Is he not a Christian? Let's find out what a Christian is so we can determine whether Tim, Tim Tebow or, or anybody, you know, Tom, Tom, Dick, or Harry, or whoever is a Christian or not. We can, define, we can find that out by simply looking at the Bible. And so that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. But I uh, want to give you some more information before we uh, uh, go any further, uh, if you want to email me, friends, a word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. Uh, 276 340 2653 is how you can reach me uh, by my cell phone anytime uh, during the week after the program's over, whatever you want to call and ask me a question. That's my, that's my personal phone number. So you can call and ask me a question that way, and I'll be glad to. Uh, study the Bible with you, come out and have a Bible study with you, or meet you somewhere and have a Bible study with you. Um, or like I said, you can come visit us at 250 the Boulevard. But we want you to know that we want to uh, want you to feel free to be in touch with us. So to uh, to reach me, it's 276-340-2653. That's my personal number. But if you want to be part of the program today, it's area code 336-427-9696 or 627-9563. And that's how you can reach us today. So, what is a Christian? Here's the here's the question that was uh, asked on uh, one of the comments of our uh, YouTube lesson. The YouTube the YouTube lesson was was titled "Tim Tebow and, and Colin Kaepernick are doing the same thing." And you may recall that uh, Tim Tebow was known for kneeling, and so is Colin Kaepernick known for kneeling, taking a knee. And you might say, well, the difference is Tim Tebow took a knee in prayer and Colin Kaepernick took a knee in protest. But, uh, you know, the lesson we dealt with, how they were doing the same thing. I'm not going to go into that lesson right now, but the, quite, the comment that was made in response to that was, who are you to judge whether or not Tim Tebow is a Christian? Well, uh, that was, that was uh, Texan writer... 76465, and uh, that sounds like a zip code in Texas. That may be where that's from. But uh, so, Texan writer, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, the Bible is the determination or the determining factors whether someone's a Christian or not. 
it's not really whether I'm a judge of it. I'm simply dictating or telling what is what the Bible already says. So if that makes me a judge, then I, I think that's right. Jesus said, "Judge righteous judgment." John seven twenty four. So we can judge. We can make a, we can make a determination if someone's a Christian or not a Christian. And I would say that um, that the 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 uh, the writer Texan writer seven six four six five is would make judgments on whether anybody else is a Christian. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of individuals that that Texan writer uh, seven six four six five was going to say, you know, they're not really a Christian, or they are a Christian. So, really, what I'm doing is simply what the Bible is saying that I can do. And a lot of people don't want to judge. They don't want us to say uh, to make a so-called judgment because they think for some reason that is something that's wrong. That's something the Bible condemns. Well. The Bible doesn't condemn judging. It actually authorizes judging. As we said in John 7, 24, Jesus said, Judge not by appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The, the judging that is usually uh, quoted, or the verse that is usually quoted when it comes to judging, is in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. And he's not saying don't judge in that verse. He's saying don't judge and not realize you're going to be judged again. The very next verse, verse 2 says, For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. So he's not, he's not condemning judging. He's condemning judging and not holding yourself to the same standard. And that's really what most people who say don't judge do. They quote a verse that actually condemns them because they judge and say that you shouldn't judge. And in reality, they're doing the very thing that Jesus is condemning. They're not willing to be held up to the same standard. So, so what is a Christian? What is a Christian? This uh, 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 writer says that I can't say that Tim Tebow is a Christian or not. Well, let's just decide what is a Christian. You know, friends, the word Christian is only found three times in the Bible. Actually, Christian is found twice, and Christians is found one time, but together they're only found three times in the Bible. That's Acts 11, 26, and again, I hope you have your pen and paper ready, and you're writing down these notes, uh, but in Acts 11, 26, or Acts 26, 28, and 1 Peter 4, verse 16. In Acts 11, 26, the Bible says they were called Christians first at Antioch. In Acts 26, and verse 28, Agrippa tells Paul, Thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. And in 1 Peter 4.16, Peter says that if any man suffer as a Christian, then let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So what we want to find out is what is a Christian? And can we find out something about a Christian, what a Christian is, from these verses? And I say we can. We can find a lot out about what a Christian is based on these verses, and then we can determine if, in fact, uh, Tim Tebow or, or anybody else is a, uh, a Christian or not. So let's start off with First Timoth uh, First Peter chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16. Let's just find out uh, what, what uh, the Bible says about a Christian, and it, can we find out if someone is a Christian or not. Now notice, in First Peter 4 and verse 15 and 16, Here's what Peter says. He says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So here's what we know about a Christian. A Christian might suffer, but Peter says you shouldn't suffer as an evildoer. That is, don't suffer as someone who's a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody, something like that. So there's a contrast that's being given here between a Christian and a, a non-Christian, you might say. Now, here's the thing, friends. A Christian is someone who's going to refrain from being like the world. That's, that's really the bottom line. So if you want to say, well, is someone a Christian, you might first start off by saying, well, do they act like the world? You know, do, do they act like the world? In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Romans 12, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, how do I know if someone's a Christian? Well, let's start by looking at what they say and what they do, how they act. Are they acting like the world? Are they being conformed to the world? Or are they transformed? Are they different? Now, someone might say, well, Tim Tebow is definitely different from the world. I mean, Tim Tebow is, is uh, I, I think he's pretty much a stand-up guy as far as just as far as far uh, being a person goes. Uh, I mean, I think he's, uh, uh, from what I've, when I hear him talk and I hear him act and how he's handled himself in different situations, I think he uh, comes across as, a, as an upstanding person. But that doesn't mean that he's a Christian. I mean, there's a lot of good people, right? that don't do a lot of things that the world does. I mean, you say, well, this guy doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't curse, he, he's polite, he uses good manners, he's very uh, courteous, he's very um, uh, uh, thankful and, and gracious. I mean, when uh, when uh, Tim Tebow was uh, playing for the uh, uh, New England Patriots, uh, he actually had an opportunity to uh, sign an endorsement and I don't know if it's worth millions of dollars. I don't know exactly how many millions of dollars it was. Maybe just one million, but who cares? I mean, to me, after a million, who's counting? But he had the opportunity to sign this endorsement, and he actually went to the the coach, the New England head coach, uh, Bill Belichick, and he said, uh, you know, I've got this opportunity to sign this endorsement, uh, but if you think it's going to be too much of a distraction for the team, I won't do it. And... The coach said, I appreciate you coming and asking me that, you know, and he said, I really wish you wouldn't do it because, yeah, it will be a distraction, and and so Tim Tebow didn't do it. Well, it wasn't too long after that that, that uh, the Patriots cut Tim Tebow. And, you know, some people could be bitter. I mean, <laughs> when I'm looking at it, I think that's pretty that's pretty low down and sorry. If you have an idea you're going to be cutting the guy and yet you're preventing him from uh, signing a million-dollar uh, deal to uh, you know make some money here on, on this endorsement, but but you know when I heard Tim Debo talking about it, he was like you know that's all that's fine you know I appreciate the opportunity to play for the Patriots and blah blah blah. So I think yeah he's a pretty upstanding guy, but friends that doesn't mean that he's a Christian. I mean a Christian doesn't behave like the world. Let's look at it uh, again. Let's look at another verse here in Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. And verse 22, listen to what the Bible says. Paul says, "Put off the, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for you are all members of one of another. Be angry and sin not, let not your son go down. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now, here is here is one way you can tell if someone's a Christian or not. You know how do they uh, uh, um, treat other people? I mean, here Paul saying, "Look, him that stole steal no more. Rather let him labor, working with his hands, so he can give." Now, a thief, a thief, someone who's definitely not a Christian, they steal, they take from people, they don't, they don't work, and they take from those who do. But Paul says, on the contrast, what you ought to do is turn around and you ought to work, labor with your hands, so that you can have to give. And so that makes a, a pretty stark contrast into someone who's a Christian or not a Christian. Now, Paul goes on to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the ears. Uh, verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You know, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, when I see these things, friends, and I, I'm, I'm reading this, I realize, you know what, there is there is a, a, a picture of what a Christian is like. A Christian doesn't do things that the world will do. A Christian's not going to say things. He's not going to act a certain way. He's going to carry himself and behave a certain way. That's going to uh, indicate that he is a Christian. Continue reading in, in Ephesians 
chapter 5. Come on down. We're finishing chapter 4. Now, come on down to chapter 5. And listen to what Paul says. Verse 3. Ephesians 5, verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving, uh, rather giving of thanks. Now, this is what what you're starting to see. How many times, friends, have you known someone to profess that they're a Christian, and yet their words and their deeds, their actions, tell you a, a you know, that's that's all a lie. That's just a, a facade. That's just a front. You know, they'll wear their cross around their neck, necklace with a cross on it. And then the things that come out of their mouth are just vulgar. You know, they'll say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Uh, I read my Bible. And then their behavior just is, is coarse and crude. I mean, Paul said in Ephesians 5, verse 5, he said, For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So this is what we're talking about. When individuals say that they're Christians and their lives uh, show something different, you know right off they're not a Christian. Now, let's get back to Tim Tebow. You said, James, you just talked about how great Tim Tebow was, how he he's uh, clean, you know, he's not, uh, you never hear any foolish talking coming out of him. Now, I don't know, I'm not around him all the time. But what I've heard, I've, I've never heard that. It seemed like he's a pretty uh, clean, upstanding type fella. Uh, no communication. Seemed like he's you know tender-hearted, forgiving, and that sort of thing. So you said, well, see, he's a Christian. No, I didn't say that. I said a Christian possesses those characteristics. But that doesn't mean that just because someone possesses those characteristics that they're automatically a Christian. See? But we do have a picture starting to form about what a Christian would be like. So it's like this, if I said everybody stand up who professes to be a Christian, and everybody stands up, and I said now everybody that tells dirty jokes, or tells racial jokes, or off-color jokes, or uses vulgar language, filthy language, you know, curses, every other word comes out of your mouth is a curse word, or, um, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain, you don't know, take a seat. Everybody that's, that's always uh, uh, trying to fight someone, and got a chip on their shoulder, and you know, they've just got a grudge and everything. You take a seat. You're not a Christian. So that eliminates a lot of people. So you can you can start setting people down, and it's like the like the a TV show. And I believe it says, you know, the real so and so stand up. Well, the real Christian needs to stand up. And everybody that that has these worldly characteristics, worldly traits. You just go ahead and sit down because you're not a Christian. You are not manifesting or you're not demonstrating that you have these Christian characteristics. So, so number one, we can learn what a Christian is by knowing that if he is an evildoer or they're participating in things that the Bible would condemn, that right off the bat is not being a Christian. He's not, uh, if he suffers shame, he's not going to suffer as a Christian. He's going to suffer as an evildoer. So for those reasons. So we know that a Christian uh, has certain things that are not in his life, but we still don't know what a Christian is. See that? We still don't know what it is. We know kind of what it looks like, but we don't really know what, what a Christian is. So we have to move to another verse. Now, we're going to look at Acts 11, verse 26 next. Now, it may be that, uh, let me just take the time here. Maybe that you're, you're listening. You're saying, you know what? I, I want to uh, put some input on this. Go ahead. Here's our phone number, 336-427-9696. That's 427-WMYN uh, or 627-9563, 627-9563, 627-WLOE. If you want to be part of the program, uh, give us a call. Let us know. We're talking about uh, what is a Christian? What would your definition of a Christian be? We, we're going to look at the Bible and get the Bible's definition of a Christian and find out what a Christian is does or how a Christian acts or how a Christian uh, lives in order to help identify what a Christian really is. And then we're going to, in the process, we're going to answer the question, is Tim Tebow a Christian? Uh, all right, so let's look at Acts 11, verse 26. In Acts 11, verse 26, maybe we need to get a little context here. 
Uh, but in Acts 11 and verse 26, we find Barnabas has gone to get Paul. And he is, or Saul, as he's still called at this point. And uh, he's going to bring him to Antioch. And so he went, to, he went to Tarsus to seek Saul. And the Bible says, when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, what kind of person is a Christian? What do you learn from this verse? Well, let's back up and get a little more context. I want you to notice something about this context that tells you something about how a Christian would act, how a Christian would behave. If you back up in Acts chapter 11, go ahead and back up to a verse, uh, about verse 17. Now, let me just lay some groundwork here, what's going on in Acts 11, in, in case you're not familiar with it. And by the way, friends, I, I, I tell you know, our brethren all the time, if you want to memorize the Bible, memorize one thing from each chapter, and you'll know the general content of the whole Bible. You'll memorize the Bible that way. In Acts chapter 11, um, you might know that this is where Peter is giving a defense to the Christians about why he went to Cornelius' house in chapter 10. And so he's giving a defense why he went and talked to the Gentiles, and he's telling them uh, what happened. And he said, I went up there and I told them words whereby they would be saved. Verse 14, and he says, the Holy, as he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. And he remembered uh, the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then he says in verse 17, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And then verse 18, now this is, the, this is the verse I want us to key on. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So, what, what does this tell us about a Christian? Well, notice this. Up until this time, Gentiles had not been given the gospel. They hadn't, the gospel wasn't preached to the Gentiles up until this point. The next verse says, in verse 19, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Now that persecution, you can read about it in chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8. Chapter 6 is where you meet Stephen. Chapter 7 is Stephen's sermon to the Jews and uh, they stone him. Chapter 8, he, he dies and we read about Saul starting to persecute the church and so everybody... Everybody scattered. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, the Bible says, um, Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. But Acts uh, 11 and verse 19 tells us that they that were scattered abroad and preached everywhere, they were preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So up until this time, until Peter uh, comes on the scene and is told to go to uh, Cornelius' house, Gentiles had not been included in the gospel message, but now they have. And, and the point I want you to see this is this. In verse 18 when they realized that the gospel was supposed to go to the Gentiles, true Christians rejoiced. They glorified God. They held their peace and said, you know what? It's good. God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, there's going to be a big discussion about whether Gentiles should be circumcised or not. That's coming up in Acts 15. But the point I want you to see is this. When individuals realize that God wants everybody to hear the gospel, true Christians say, who are we to fight against God? True Christians say, you know what, I, I, I don't fight against God. I'm going to take the gospel to everybody. Now, let's, let's compare this to some things that we hear in the religious world today. 
Jesus gave the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28 uh, and verse 19, the great commission, uh, uh, Matthew says, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, the great commission is to go into every creature and to all the world. Now, there are some individuals that claim to be Christians, and yet you'll hear them say, well, you don't need to go into all the world. You don't need to preach the gospel to every creature. Because there are some people that are going to be saved without hearing the gospel. Now, I know I've played uh, a couple times on this, on this program uh, Billy Graham saying there are people who don't even know the name of Christ that are going to be in heaven. Now, friends, if you can get to heaven, if someone can get to heaven without hearing the gospel, then what's the point of going? But Jesus says to go. So here is, here is my conclusion. If Jesus says to go, and Christians are individuals who follow Christ, I mean, Acts 11.26 says the disciples were called Christians, first in Antioch, then the disciples are going to do what Jesus said. If Jesus said go into all the world, then they're going to go into all the world. But if someone comes along and tells me, well, everybody doesn't have to go into all the world. The gospel's not for everybody. Then that tells me, you know what, that person is not really a Christian. They may claim to be a Christian. You know, we, we're into all this identity stuff in our society today. And they may identify themselves as a Christian. And like I said, they may wear uh, uh necklace that has a cross on it or they may you don't know, have a bumper sticker that says I'm a member of the whatever whatever church and they may have all kinds of you know they may wear t-shirts that have church logos on it and whatever but that doesn't make them a Christian if individuals will tell you well there's no need to preach the gospel of a creature they're not a Christian and if individuals will tell you that well there's only certain groups of people that are going to be saved. They're not Christians. He said, well, James, now wait a minute. You just, you're just talking about people that believe in limited atonement. You know, this Calvinist doctrine that says there's only a select number of people that are going to be saved. That's exactly right. Friends, if you think that there's only a select number of people that are going to be saved, that is that God has predetermined everybody that's going to be saved, and that the gospel is n not doing anybody uh, good unless they are one of those chosen few. Or if you think that Christ came and died for only a limited number of people, then you're not a Christian. Not, not by what the Bible is saying. The Bible says the gospel is for everybody. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so when I'm looking at Acts 11 and 26, I see that, you know what, here's people, Christians, they rejoice when they realize, you know what, even the Gentiles are supposed to hear the gospel. Now, there were some in, in uh, the first century that they didn't like to hear that. They certainly didn't like to hear that the Gentiles have heard the gospel. But most of those were Jews, and they weren't interested in obeying the gospel anyway. They were just trying to undermine the preaching of the gospel. When you hear, when you uh, uh, read things... Um, that went on, like in Acts chapter 4, uh, or excuse me, let's just go to Acts chapter 13 and verse 46. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves worthy of ever, unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, why did they say that? Because in verse 45, the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So, these are people that are trying to undermine the spreading of the gospel. I know they're not Christians. And when I hear someone say, well, I don't have to go and preach, I don't have to go and teach, I don't have to go into all the world, or the God, it's not necessary that we go, because God has to um, operate on these people in order for them to be saved. I talked to a man on the phone for about an hour uh, last week and 
you know, it gets right down to it. You know, he's at the end of the conversation, he said, well, I'm kind of Calvinist. And I said, yeah, it's, it's not just kind of. You know, you're a lot of Calvinist. You know, born in sin, God has to operate on you. Well, if God has to operate on you and save you, then why should I go preach? Why should I go preach the gospel? See? Now, that tells me right there, individuals that believe that kind of that doctrine are not Christians. Because their, their belief system goes contrary to what we know the Bible says you should do. So, Christians rejoice at the fact that other people, other races, creeds, colors, whatever, are hearing the gospel and are obeying it. That they're coming out of the religions that they once held. You never find someone in the first century rejoicing at the diversity of religion. What you, what you find in the first century, friends, you find true Christians, like Paul and the early Christians in, the, in, in their church, they're converting people out of religions that are not authorized by God. And that would include Judaism. When, when, when people say, well, we got to, we got to save Israel where God chose the people, no, that's, that's hogwash. That's, 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 that's the devil's lie. The Jews were to bring Christ into the world. And they did that. They served a purpose. Now they have to obey the gospel like everybody else. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. The gospel is for everyone who believeth. It's the power of God to save, Romans 1.16. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. One gospel for Jew and Gentile. And when I hear people say, well, there's one gospel for the Jews and one gospel for the Gentiles. You know what? That's not a Christian. That's, that is not a, that's not Christian doctrine. That's not Christian teaching. That's not what a Christian would, would believe or follow because it's not in the Bible. A Christian would rejoice that one gospel can save uh, Jews and Gentiles alike. And I lear I'm learning this just from Acts chapter 11. I'm learning what a Christian is like. So when someone says, well, what is a Christian? Well, I know what a Christian does. <clears throat> now you say, well, well, what about Tim Tebow then? Is Tim Tebow really a Christian? Well, does Tim Tebow believe that you have to go and preach the gospel all all the world? I don't know if he believes that or not. He's supposedly, I guess, evangelical. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what his uh, 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 religious preference is. I would say he's probably uh, Baptist more than anything. Uh, he's. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that his um, background is in. Uh, is Baptist, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything nowadays. Uh, most people are pretty ecumenical when it comes to what they believe and so forth. So, but if if he's saying that all you have to do is say a little prayer or ask Jesus to come to your heart, which I, I've heard him say words to those effect, I know he's not he's not teaching the gospel. I know he's not teaching what the Bible would say a person needs to do. So, is he a good guy? Yeah. He may exhibit all kinds of Christian characteristics, like not, not being an evildoer, but in the sense of, is he taking the gospel to all the world? No, he's not. He doesn't, he doesn't preach the gospel. But let's look at another point from, we'll come back to Tim Tebow, but in, in Acts 11, verse 26, notice, here, here's another point about Christians. The Bible says in Acts 11 and verse 26, now I want you to listen carefully. Because this is going to eliminate a whole lot of people that profess to be Christians. Listen to what these Christians did. And it came to pass that a whole year, now this is Acts eleven twenty six. 26, it came to pass a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now what does that tell you about a Christian? Well, here's what I'm looking at. These disciples were assembling themselves with the church. They were assembling together. Now, a Christian is someone who assembles with the church. Now, if I ask everybody who's listening, are you a Christian? And everybody says, oh yeah, well stand up if you're a Christian. All right, I'm good to go. Everybody's standing up. And I said, now everybody who says that the church is not important, take a seat. 
Now, there's a lot of people going to be sitting down because I know they'll say, well, church is not important. Now, what if I said, now, everybody who believes that assembling with the church is not important, take a seat. There's going to be a lot more people sitting down. And here's why. See, friends, when if you believe, if you believe that the church is not important, then it stands to reason that you believe that it's not important to assemble with the church. And there's a lot of individuals that say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, where do you assemble? Well, I don't go anywhere. You're not a Christian. I mean, that tells me right now you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. Because in the first century, Christians assembled with the church. I, I get that from Acts 11, verse 26. The verse that says, and they were called Christians first in Antioch. So Christians, that, that was a name that was given to individuals who were assembling with the church. They were assembled together. Now, the church is the body of believers. The church would be individuals who had been obedient to the gospel, and those Christians were assembling together. That's when the church comes together. Paul said in uh, Acts, excuse me, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and uh, verse 18, he said, when you come together in the church, so members of the Lord's church would be coming together. Christians would be coming together. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, he said, uh, when you come together into one place, that's, that is how the church assembles. So when I hear someone say, well, the church is not important, or, quote, going to church is not important, well, that tells me you're not really a Christian. A Christian doesn't say that. A Christian doesn't say, well, it's not important uh, not to assemble on the first day of the week. When the Bible clearly, clearly shows examples of individuals meeting on the first day of the week for certain purposes. And individuals don't meet, they don't assemble with a church if they don't believe the church is important. Now you you can just ask your religious neighbor, ask your preacher, is, is, is the church important? And they'll say no. You, you talk to the you talk to the uh, the Latter Day Saints, the Mormons, when they come knock on your door. Do I have to be a member of the of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints to be saved? Oh no. Why don't I want to be part of it? If it's not essential, you know I've heard Presbyterians say the same thing. No, you don't have to be a member of the Presbyterian Church. No, you don't have to be a member of the Baptist Church to be saved. Then why be a part of it? So that tells me right there they're not Christians because Christians assembled with the church. See how easy it is, friends? Now you say, well, so you mean everybody that goes to church, they're Christians. No, I didn't say that either. There was a lot of people today that were assembling together. There's a lot of people that are assembling right now probably, are getting ready to assemble, and they're, they're going to all congregate into one place. Now, would Christians do that? Yes, Christians assemble on the first day of the week. But everybody that assembles together on the first day of the week does not mean they're Christians. See what I'm talking about? It's just you can eliminate things. You can say, well, here's what we know. Here's what we know. If a person uh, doesn't curse or drink or do drugs, doesn't cheat, doesn't lie, you know, good upstanding citizen, uh, use good manners, polite, courteous, whatever, they may be Christian. No. Well, they may be Christians, but that doesn't mean that they are. And just because someone is assembling on the first day of the week doesn't mean they're Christians either. See? Now, you can you can guarantee that if they don't do those things, you know, you can say, well, I know that they're not Christians. See, so what we're finding is we're finding, well, this is what this is what Christians do, but it does it mean everybody that does these things doesn't mean that they're Christians. No, it doesn't. See, Christians Christians assembled in the first century just like they do now for a particular reason. Number one, notice this, they assembled together for teaching. Go back to Acts 11 and verse 26. Acts 11 verse 26, what does it say? It says they assembled the whole, they, that a whole year they assembled themselves together with the church and taught much people. You know why they were assembled? There's a number of reasons why they were assembled. One of them was to be taught. One of them was to be taught. Now, friends, I've been been to 
a lot of religious assemblies and gatherings and there is not a whole lot of teaching going on. There's a lot of hooping and hollering. There's a lot of loud music that can, you know, wake up the dead. I've, I've seen rolling on the floor. I've seen jumping and shouting. I've seen hooping and hollering. I didn't see any teaching, really, other than how to get a good cardio workout, I guess. But in the first century, they were assembled together to be taught. They taught much people. So here's what I'm saying. If you... See a group of people, oh, they're assembling together, they must be Christians. No. Why don't you take a look at their assembly? What's it like? Any teaching going on? Friends, if, you want to, if you're wanting to assemble with a group of people where you can be taught something, the Church of Christ, true Christians are where you need to assemble, are the group you need to assemble with. They're the ones you need to say, hey, this, you know, I, I need to assemble with these folks. These folks are teaching the Bible. Now that's why I say, you know, I know I'm a Christian. Because that's what happened. We assembled together. We're, we're all about teaching. As a matter of fact, let's look at another time when they assembled. In Acts 20, in verse 7, here's, here's uh, disciples. Acts 20, in verse 7, the Bible says, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Now, remember, the, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch in Acts 11, verse 26. Now we have the disciples assembling together on the first day of the week. To break bread. They came together to break bread. That is, they came together, that's for the Lord's Supper. That's a, that's a, um, uh, what, a synecdoche for uh, breaking bread means that they were, uh, that's a part for the whole. That's the Lord's Supper. We know that's not a common meal because later on they're going to have a common meal and Paul's going to eat. But notice this, they came together for this purpose, to observe the Lord's Supper. And what did Paul do while we're all here? While we're all here, while we are all here, Paul is going to preach unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And he continued his speech till midnight. They're all about teaching. Every time there's an opportunity, Christians came together, they let's let's teach. Let's have some instruction. Now, when when I see a group of people coming together, well, are y'all having Bible study? No, not tonight. Uh, there's uh, the Eden Baptist Church down on the boulevard, right down right down the street from where we are. One time, uh, a brother and I went down there and talked to um, a preacher's name is uh, Daryl Law. Talked to him one time, and we walked in, and we said, oh, yeah, it's a Wednesday night. We've been invited. Are you having Bible study tonight? No, we're not. We have not singing and prayer meeting. And I said, well, will you have Bible study next week? I don't know. Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. I mean, you don't know when you're going to have Bible study? So that right there tells me, you know what, Christians, we come together. We're coming together in one place. We're going to study the Bible if it's on, on occasion like this. Now, also on the first day of the week, they came together and they laid by in store, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And again, they were being taught how to give. So, so when you say, well, everybody comes together, they must be Christians. No. Are they coming together to be taught, to be edified? Are they being taught the truth? And everybody that came together, also notice this, they wore the name of Christ. They called themselves Christians. They were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, if you want to eliminate individuals who are Christians or not, just try this. Everybody's a Christian, stand up. Everybody stands up. Now, everybody that calls themselves by another name as well, like Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Holiness, Whatever. Take a seat. Everybody sits down. See, friends, when you ask me, you say, James, what well, are you religiously? I'm a Christian. I know, but what denomination are you? I'm not in a denomination. I'm in the Lord's church. I'm a Christian. Yeah, but what church do you go to? I'm a member of the Lord's church. I'm a Christian. I'm just a Christian. I obey the gospel. That's, that's the name I wear. In James 2 and verse 7, James 2 and verse 7, James says, do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? What name were they called? They were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, friends, do you find it interesting that people profess to be Christians and then yet they won't wear the name Christ? They won't say, well, Christ is my Savior, but they won't wear the name Christ. Unless you press them and say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. 
But I go over here to the Baptist church. I go over here. What? No, you're not. You're not a Christian. You just admit it. You're not a Christian. Don't don't be ashamed about it. Don't get defensive about it. Own it. You know. But don't get mad when I say you're not a Christian. If you tell me, if you just told me that you're something else. You tell me you're something else, and I call you that. Well, excuse me for just calling you what you said you were. If you told me your name was was uh, John Brown, and then I I said your name's John Brown, and I started calling you John Brown. Don't get I'm not my name's not John Brown. My name's Christian. You said your name's John Brown. Why don't you just tell me what your name is? See, they were called Christians first at Antioch. And so I, can, I know that individuals who assemble together are not necessarily Christians because many of them, majority of them, don't even, don't even want to wear the name Christ. See? All right, so we've got one more, one more verse we need to look at to, in order to find out what a Christian is. And I'm running out of time, but if you want to be a part of the program, let me give you the phone numbers one more time. Area code 336-427-9696. That's 427 W M Y N or six two seven nine five six three six two seven W L O E. We'll be glad to take your phone phone calls. Now, friends, <clears throat> excuse me. So we still haven't figured out what a Christian is. All right. Well, let's look at Acts twenty six and verse twenty eight. Acts twenty six verse twenty eight. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now we're getting somewhere. I think we can find out what a Christian is if we can just figure out what it was that Agrippa was almost persuaded to become. What, what had Paul done? What did Paul said to him that almost persuaded him? Well, let's notice this. In Acts chapter 26, if you back up to verse 3, and I'm not going to take the time to read all this because I know that it's it's lengthy and you can go through and read it on your own. But in Acts chapter 26, in verse 3, Paul is given a chance to defend himself. And he lays the groundwork out. He's, he's going he's to lay the groundwork out about how he became a Christian. And obviously he was a Christian. Agrippa said, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And so Paul says, well, number one, Agrippa, this is verse 3, and I'm going to paraphrase. He said, I know that you're an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. So you hear me patiently. I, I know you're an expert on it, but just be patient with me. I'm going to lay some groundwork out here. And then he says, in beginning in verse 4, he says, Now, everybody knows what kind of person I was. He said, Everybody knows the manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. And they knew me from the beginning, but they just won't admit it. He said they won't testify of it. He said, but they knew that I was very, very zealous. I was a, I was a, a Pharisee. I lived after the, the straightest sect of our religion, that is the Pharisees. And notice Paul's actually admitting that he knows that the, uh, that the Jewish system was divided, right? Everybody that was a Jew wasn't really a Jew. I mean, they were a Pharisee Jew or a Sadducee Jew or whatever Jew. So, right there, there's a faction there. But he says, he said, they know I'm a Pharisee. But he says, now, he says, what I'm being questioned about is I'm qu being questioned about the fact that I actually am doing what the law said I should do. That is, if you know the prophets, you know the Messiah's coming. And he said, that's what I'm being judged about. I'm being judged of the hope of the promise made unto God our fathers. That's verse 6. Unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, have hope to come, for which hope sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Now, Agrippa knows these things. He's, he's familiar with what goes on in Judaism and what their beliefs are. So he knew, surely he knew that there was a prophecy about a Messiah coming, and, and so here's Paul saying, I'm just, I'm just believing that the prophecies have been fulfilled, that the promise has, has, has been fulfilled. And so then he begins to tell Cornelius that, I'm assuming Agrippa, he, he then tells Agrippa about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now he doesn't say death, burial, and resurrection, but look what he says in verse 8. He said, 
Why should it be thought an incredible thing with you that God should raise the dead? I mean, every Jew should be willing to accept the fact that someone was raised from the dead. I mean, how many times had God raised somebody from the dead in the Old Testament? You see? I mean, you got prophets bringing widow sons to life. You got people being thrown in a pit, leaning on, uh, I believe it was Elisha's bones, and the guy revives and comes back to life again, right? You have individuals being raised from the dead. Um, and so why should that be something that's, that's hard to believe? But notice, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to come on down through here. So then Paul starts telling him about his uh, behavior, how he persecuted the church of Christ. And I say he persecuted the church of Christ because he was told that it was Christ that he was persecuting, Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. Uh, Jesus said, I, I am Christ whom you're persecuting. And then he talks about his conversion in verses 13 through 19. Now, when Paul's telling about his conversion, he talks about, I saw, I was on the road to Damascus and I saw a great light and the voice from heaven told me that it was Christ. And I said, what would you have me do? And he tells me to go into the, to the city and I'll be converted. Now, he doesn't tell Agrippa that very story, but he's already told that, that conversion account before to uh, uh, Fest, to Felix in uh, Acts 24. And, and, and so he's saying in Acts 22, he was told, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? So everything that Paul has been t is saying to Agrippa is laying out the conversion account that he went through. And that is why when he gets to the certain point, Agrippa says, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Well, what Paul had done was laid out, what Paul had done was laid out the, uh, the process by which he became a Christian. In verse six, uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, friends, listen to this. Paul said, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was a pattern of how to become a Christian. Paul was a pattern of how to become a Christian, and that's why Agrippa said, You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. So, what had Paul said? Obviously, Paul had said, You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and he tells Agrippa, I know you believe. I know you believe these things because they weren't done in the corner. Acts chapter 26 and uh, verse 26. He says, The king knoweth these things before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things were hidden from him. For this thing was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. You know what that tells me? Agrippa believed. But yet he wasn't a Christian. So what does that tell you? Friends, that tells me if someone tells you all you got to do is believe and ask Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved, you'll be a Christian, that tells me, no, nope. that's not what a Christian would say and that's not how you become a Christian. If all you had to do is believe, Paul would have become a Christian on the road to Damascus when he realized that was Christ that was talking to him. But instead, Christ told him to go into, into the city and Ananias had to come and tell him what to do to be saved. He was praying for three days, fasting and praying for three days. He was miserable. So he sure wasn't saved, but he sure believed. See, belief is not when you become a Christian. So that tells me if someone says, all you have to do is believe to be saved, nope, you're not a Christian. And if that's what you did, to, and you think you're saved, friend, you're not a Christian. Now, don't, now listen, don't get mad at me, I'm just telling you. If belief is all it takes to become a Christian, Agrippa would have been a Christian. But instead, Agrippa even admits, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian, to be a Christian. Why didn't Paul say, well, well if you believe, Agrippa, you're already a Christian. You know why? Because it's not about belief only. It's about being obedient to the gospel. And so what Agrippa would have had to do would have had to done in order to become a Christian, he would have had to done what Paul did to become a Christian. He would have had to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He would have to have confessed his faith in Christ, that he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts chapter 8 
in verse 36. He would have to repent of his sins. Acts 17, verse 30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. See? And, and he would have had to have been baptized for the remission of sins. Why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Acts 22, 16. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. But Paul didn't, you know, but, but Agrippa uh, didn't do that. Agrippa said, you, you've almost persuaded me to do that. Now, what does that have to do with Tim Tebow? For instance, Tim Tebow won't tell you to be baptized, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He'll tell you, say a little prayer. Right? He'll tell Jesus come into your heart. Now, so is Tim Tebow a Christian? No. He's not. He's not. And individuals who listen to Tim Tebow aren't Christians either, who do what he do what who do what he says. And the sad thing is we have brethren in the Church of Christ that, that believe the same that will that will tout Tim Tebow as, as being some great uh minister. I mean, one of the universities in Tennessee, Freed Hardman University, had Tim Tebow as a fun, for a fundraiser, please. And these are the same these are the same kind of people that have guys like Doug Dynasty. You know, oh, Doug Dynasty, they're good folks. They pray every time, you know, every time the show comes on or goes off the air, they're always praying. Well, okay, but there's a lot of people bowing knees in prayer. It doesn't make them Christians. How do I know? Well, Paul, for one, Saul of Tarsus was praying for three days and he wasn't a Christian. So just because you're on your knees praying doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just like just because you don't curse, you don't drink, and you're good to your wife, and you're good to your kids, and you pay your taxes, you pay your bills, and you know, you're you a good upstanding citizen. That doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you go to church on the first day of the week, that doesn't mean you're a Christian. If you hadn't obeyed the gospel, friends, you're, you're not a Christian. And if you just believe that Jesus Christ can come into your heart and save you and you said a little prayer, you're not a Christian. So what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who's obeyed the gospel. Obeyed the gospel just like Saul of Tarsus had done. Just like the Bible says. Everywhere in the New Testament, friends, when someone has obeyed the gospel, when someone has been saved from their sins, they, they've all had to hear the gospel, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess Christ before man, and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And God added them to the church. Acts 2 verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as, such, such as should be saved. They weren't added to a denomination. There weren't any denominations. See, so that, that tells me right there that if someone says, well, I'm a Christian because I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in all these different churches. No, you can't be. They weren't in the first century. Why would I believe that you're a member of the Lord's church or that you're a Christian when you're in a church that Christ didn't die for, that God didn't add you to? Paul didn't know about it. As a matter of fact, if you really want to be like Paul, you ought to leave the religion you're in. That's what he did. He said, I left, I left the uh, religious, divided religion of my day. He left the Jews' religion. His father's religion, as he called it in Galatians 1, verse 13. He said, I left it. I left it. You know what you ought to do? You ought to leave the divided religion that you're in. Because all, they're all divided up. They're all denominations. You know? You need to get back to the Bible. Friends, we're meeting at 250 the Boulevard, and we're trying, to get, we're trying to stay with the Bible. We want to make sure that what we say is what the Bible says. We speak what the Bible speaks. We're silent what the Bible says. We're doing Bible things in Bible ways. Calling Bible things by Bible names, getting back to the Bible, so that we can be Christians, and that's that's how I know what a Christian is, by looking at the Bible, letting it define us, and let it let it guide us, and let us instruct us on what we must do in order to be saved. Friends, I'm running against the clock, so I want to give you uh, content information one more time. If you want to reach me, uh, two seven six three four zero two six five three, two seven six three four zero two six five three. Or you can email me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. Come visit, visit with us at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And on Sundays at 9 and 10 a.m. and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Remember uh, the program here every Sunday at 5 p.m. And we hope that you will tell your friends and we'll see you back next week. Until next time, 
always make sure you get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.